until the last 25 years or 30 years. Jews have always had a better deal from Muslims than from Christians. They have always been safer in a Muslim country than in a Christian one. And it has been the so-called Protestant Christian countries where they have often suffered most. I think you may have come thinking that I was going to give you ammunition for intercession for Israel. It may be that our prayers may be prayers of repentance and asking for forgiveness. In Birmingham recently I laid on a special meeting on a Sunday afternoon and asked Christians to come along and bring any Jew they knew and it was amazing they didn't believe they could bring any but it was amazing how many Jews came but at the end of it a young man about 30 28 maybe came up he was had a rough, tough face, cauliflower ear and a rough, rugged face. And he was sobbing his heart out. Big chap. And he was crying like a baby. And he said, I've only been a Christian a month. He said, I was a prize fighter. <laughs> and I could see he, he was. He was a, a real fighter, a boxer. And he said, I've never cried since I became a man. I said, what are you crying for? He said, I'm crying for the Gentiles. For the Gentiles. And God had just given him a little burden in there and touched his heart, even though I've been speaking about Jews. And so we treat them as Gentiles. Now, I want to move into the biblical theological area. There are certain ideas which need to be re-examined, which we have picked up unconsciously, subliminally, in our Sunday schools and in our churches and maybe even in our colleges. The first is the idea that the Jews are collectively responsible for the death of Jesus. Not just those who shouted crucify him, we extend that first to all the Jews of his day and then we extend it to all the Jews of all time and we've got this idea that every Jew is responsible for killing Jesus. I cannot find that idea in the scripture. And we must be very, very careful before we allow it to take root in our hearts. The most commonly quoted text to explain the sufferings of the Jews over the last 2,000 years is the prayer of the Jews who shouted for his death when they said, His blood be upon us and on our children. Now that was a prayer that God would punish them and their descendants. And people say that is the explanation for all their suffering since. They asked God to do that and he did it. Well, I just want to say that within 24 hours, God heard another prayer from a Jew. And the prayer was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Which prayer do you think God heard? The one that had the name of Jesus attached to it? Or their terrible request? Now think that through. I have no doubt which one God heard. Because if unbelievers ask God to curse them and a prayer in the name of Jesus asks them for their forgiveness, I know which God hears and which his heart wants to hear. Therefore, there is following from that wrong idea, the wrong idea that all the sufferings that Jews have gone through are the curse of God upon them. I cannot believe that. Even in the Old Testament days when they suffered under the Assyrian and the Babylonian, God made it quite clear that he had no hand in the sufferings which men added to the punishment he gave. His punishment was to be out of the land. But he then, through the prophets, cursed the nations who added their own sufferings to the, or their own punishment, and who went far beyond what God had ordained. 
God's punishment was that they would be taken out of the land and they have been out of the land for 2,000 years and that has been their punishment. But Auschwitz was not God's punishment. That's what men added in their hatred. Incidentally, to go back to Germany, I miss saying something there. Um, let me just say it now. I believe that one of the motivations of Hitler was that he was jealous of their success. Listen to these figures. In pre-war Germany in the 1930s, the Jews were only 1% of the population. Only 1%. Yet listen, they provided 10% of the doctors, 16% of the lawyers, 11% of the estate agents, 17% of the bankers, 25% of the retail trade, 30% of the clothes trade, 70% of the department stores, and 75% of the university professors. And Hitler was trying to tell people that the Germans were the superior race. That, I believe, explains his hatred, as well as the demonic element in his nature. But you see, he was trying to say, we Germans are superior, and here was this 1% of the population running the country. And what he did to them was not the punishment of God. God had said they would have to be out of their land, that they would become a laughing stock among the nations. And they have been, we've all heard the joke about the Scotsman, the Irishman, and the Jew. And you know who comes off worst in all those jokes. Well, now we've got to get rid of these false ideas which are not biblical. And the third idea, which is most prevalent among Christians in Britain, which they have been taught, is that the Jews forfeited their place in God's eternal plan of salvation, that they are now Gentiles as far as God is concerned. The church has entirely replaced them and is the new Israel. And all the promises have come to us. I've noticed that people who teach this are not so keen to say that all the punishments have come to us as well. Have you noticed that? They kind of pick and choose in the prophecies and say all the punishments have gone to them and all the nice promises have come to us. And we can publish them in promise boxes and books full of nice things. Look, if we're going to pinch everything of theirs, then let's pinch the lot. As Paul did and said, you have only been grafted in because you've had faith and they were taken out because of their unbelief and that could happen to you too. That's a serious word. Paul applied the punishment to the new Israel as well as the promises. And we've got to take the lot if we're going to claim that we have replaced them. But we haven't replaced them. Let me look at five events which for me raised the question as to whether God was in all this. You see, until 1967, I assumed the Jews were finished with and that if we had any place for them, it was simply part of the general great commission to go to all nations and preach the gospel and we should send missionaries there as to anywhere else. In 1967, I sat glued to a television set for six days and something happened to me. The war was fascinating, the Six-Day War, but I began watching it because, in fact, I was due to go out to Israel for the second time in just a few days' time. And I, I was watching to see what kind of thing we were going into and whether we should go. I'd been once with um, a party of Presbyterians and all we did was take pictures of all the biblical scenes and we weren't interested in the people it struck us that they'd changed the land quite a lot but I had no understanding of God's purpose I simply went to study the past now I go to study the future and so I found myself watching that TV set when the war started and wondering what we were heading for a week later and then as I watched, I saw God's purpose being fulfilled. And I dared to preach on that Sunday morning about three days into the war about God's purpose for Israel from total ignorance. 
And that tape went round the world. It went to Golda Meir, it went round synagogues, and I began to get letters from all over the place, and it was almost as if I'd touched an electric button and it was live. Do you know what I mean? I'd hit something and I didn't know what it was. In total ignorance as a Baptist Bible teacher or what have you. And I'd touched something. That's when it began. And since then I've said there are at least five historical facts which I cannot explain in naturalistic terms. Or to put it another way, I cannot believe that the state of Israel is a political accident of history. And here are the five things. I've mentioned them already. Let me just draw them out. Number one, the survival of their identity. It is unprecedented for a nation to keep its identity through 2,000 years when they do not have their own land, their own language, their own coinage, their own army, when they have nothing that makes a nation today. And I ask, how? Did they keep their identity? Unless God kept it. The second thing was the sheer historical fact that whenever Jews have settled down and assimilated, as the word is, and become like Gentiles and behave like Gentiles, sooner or later they have been prevented from doing so by an outburst of an anti-Semitism. And I ask, why has that happened? When they've become like Gentiles and cease to be the strangers so that xenophobia goes, why is it that then something happens which turns the whole situation into a threat? In fact, I would predict now that there will be some serious outburst of anti-Semitism in America which will drive those three million Jews from New York back to Israel. But it will be in God's timing. Wherever Jews settle down permanently somewhere else in the world and forget their land, God kicks them out of the place they've settled down. And I ask, that's not a natural event. That's a supernatural. The third thing, why is it that two world wars in which the Jews were not involved as a belligerent party, that it's two world wars that have produced the state of Israel? so that the wrath of man has been caused to praise God. The Balfour Declaration at the end of World War I, following Dr. Weissman's invention of synthetic acetone from wood pulp, which saved our uh, high explosive situation. We were running out of high explosive, and a Jewish chemist in Manchester, who was later to become the first president of Israel, Dr. Weissman, invented synthetic acetone, and Lloyd George said to him, what can we do to show our gratitude you've saved this nation in World War I. And he said, you can help us to get back home. And Lord Balfour issued the Balfour Declaration on which the State of Israel has been built as a result of World War I. Then World War II comes and again there's a holocaust and again the Jews are not fighting in it and yet out of it as a direct result comes the establishment of the state in 1948. Unless God is in charge of history, I can't explain how two world wars can produce that. The fourth thing is that they have established a state against insuperable odds. And it has survived four wars in 30 years against a totally outnumbering force of six million. How? You read the story, O oh, Jerusalem, in paperback. Hope you, you will read that. I just cannot believe it. And when I've explored the places mentioned and seen that narrow little corridor that was all that stood between Jerusalem and life, I just can't understand how it happened. And so I went up at the end of the Six Day War while the fighting was still going on to the Galan Heights. And I remember seeing how they pushed bulldozers ahead of the tanks to make a new road up the hills. And as fast as the bulldozer drivers were killed, men jumped on and went on building the road up for the tanks to come. And the bulldozers were unprotected. And they got up there. But I said to an army major, how 
Did you take the Golan Heights? I saw the burning Russian lorries. I saw the artillery all pointing down the hill at the Jews. And I said, how did you get up here? And the major just went. He said nothing. I defy military experts to explain how this nation has survived four wars. Even when, in the last, they were totally caught by surprise and attacked on a day when there were no radio, no television, no buses, no taxis, nothing. Yet they did. And the final thing I would say, which is happening before our very eyes, almost the entire world is now against this nation. United Nations is against her and passed a resolution two months ago. The Arab Muslim confidence since 1973 and the resurgence of Islam. I preached my way through Daniel in 1972 and two things the Lord enabled me to say were these. Number one, the Shah of Persia will fall. This was 72. Because he had given himself the title in front of our royal family, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And God heard that. And all authority is given to Jesus. There's only one King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There are other kings and other lords. But only one King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The other thing I said was this. My understanding of Daniel would lead me to suppose that the next world power will be built on oil. A year later, the Arabs discovered what a weapon they had. And two things happened to the Arab world. The discovery of the power of oil and a resurgence of confidence in Allah. And Islam is now militant again and is the greatest threat to world peace, as the Iran-Iraq conflict shows. And yet I'm going to say this. Before your eyes in your lifetime, you will see this nation survive even worse than has happened to it already against insuperable odds. For the one name that will still be in the atlas on the last day of history will be the name Israel. And I defy you to find a naturalist explanation. So I had to say two things. First, what does scripture say on this, and particularly the New Testament? And second, what is the Spirit saying? In other words, what did God say 2,000 years ago, which is recorded here, and what is he saying today by his Spirit to the churches? And of course, I expect those two things to be perfectly in line because it's the God of truth and the same Spirit speaking. And therefore, a good check as to whether he's saying something today is, is it in line with what he said then? That's always the check on prophecy. Does it line up with what God has already said? If it doesn't, you can scrap it. But what the scripture says and what the spirit says on this subject is just so perfectly in line and so exciting that I just want to share it with you. Now what the scripture says will be simply exposition of a few things, but what the spirit says will be rather different. I should really say what the Spirit says through Scripture and what he's saying through prophecy. But just what the Scripture says and what the Spirit says is a convenient label. First of all, here is a book which is packed full of historical predictions. I'm so glad about that because it means it is wide open to examination in an objective scientific way. And. Uh, I had recently a debate in Birmingham University against Professor John Hick, who wrote The Myth of God Incarnate. And uh, the motion of the University Union was, this house believes there is one way to one God. And uh, the motion was overwhelmingly carried in front of 440 students. It was a marvelous occasion. And it's really just almost started a mini revival. And there wasn't a Christian on the committee. It was just super. <laughs> I just love to get out of Christian circles now. I love to be outside church and uh, where it's at. That's where the action is. But you see, John Hick said, you cannot judge Christian religion by objective criteria. There's no way of judging it by external criteria. And therefore, you can't know the truth of here. Well, 
I just said this and it's factual. There are 700, 735 historical predictions in this book. 24% of the verses contain a prediction. Did you know that? Nearly a quarter. Talk about the future. Now, those are 735 separate historical events. Some of them are mentioned more than once. Some are mentioned up to 300 times. But there are 735 separate predictions. How many of those do you think have actually come true and can be checked outside the Bible through secular history? The answer is 593. 82% of the things this book said would happen, happened. Now, does that mean the Bible is only 80% accurate? No. Because the rest, when you look at them, are nearly all concerned with the end of this age of history in the future. So they couldn't have happened yet. So far, the Bible has been 100% accurate in 593 predictions. And there are only 17 more to go before the end of this age. Only 17 more. Now, these were science students, many of them. And that kind of statistic we need to use, we need to tell them. This is not an esoteric book that has to be accepted blindly. As Abraham Lincoln said, accept as much of it on the basis of faith as you, uh, on the basis of reason as you can, take the rest on faith and you'll live and die a happier man. Well, you can take 80% of the predictions on reason and the other 20% on faith and you'll live and die a happier man. But you know there's not another book in the world that accurate in prediction. And yet people will buy Old Moore's Almanac. They'll listen to Gene Dixon. And they never claim to be more than about 10% right. They'll read their horoscopes. And it's rubbish, if not demonic. And yet here's the book that predicts like that. Now then, that's why prophecy is so very important. Israel is the only nation in the world that God is committed to preserving. And I read the end of Jeremiah 31 for you. What did you think of that? As long as the sun shines in the sky and the moon and the stars shine by night, so long will this people be a nation before me. Therefore, I have to ask you this question. Supposing Israel disappeared in the next Middle East war, what would happen to your faith? I will tell you honestly, mine will be deeply shaken deeply shaken but the tragedy is that for the majority of Christians in this land their faith would not be seriously affected they might have some regrets oh what a pity we'd plan to go to Israel next year but their faith would remain intact mine would not because if God does not keep that promise at the end of Jeremiah 31, how can I believe his promise that his, my sins he will remember no more in the middle of Jeremiah 31? Either God is a God of truth or is not. Now many of the promises he made were unconditional promises. The promises to Abraham that that land would be theirs forever was unconditional. Unconditional. And if God breaks that, how can I trust him? But one of the unique groups of promises which is repeated again and again is that God would bring this people back to their land a second time. Isaiah 11:11 11, 11, and many, many other references. A second time. Now he brought them back the first time from Babylon and then he scattered them for 2,000 years. But his promise stands... And if you want to read a book that really explores all those promises and shows how many there are, read a book like The State of Israel, Is It of Men or God, by Kak. K-A-C, published by Marshall Morgan and Scott. Um, a second time. Now, I have read recently, for example, F.F. F. Bruce's commentary on Romans, where he says that in Romans 9 to 11 there is no mention of a restoration to the land. That's perfectly true, there isn't. 
What there is in those chapters is the promise of a spiritual restoration rather than the physical. Now he's perfectly right, he's an accurate scholar in saying that. What is wrong is to draw from that a, c a conclusion that is untrue to the whole of Scripture. And what I came to see was this, and this was the illumination that I got in the Six Day War and that has remained with me ever since. The restoration to the Lord is dependent on the restoration to the land. For the Gentile, I can come into God's blessings anywhere. For the Jewish people as a people, he can't do it anywhere else. They were offered Uganda by the British government. Might have been better for Uganda if they'd gone. But Theodor Herzl and Weissmann, they stood firm. They said there is only one land in God's purpose for us. And therefore, though Romans 9 to 11 does not mention the land and only promises the spiritual restoration of this people to God, and so shall all Israel be saved, I came to see that he's got to get them as a nation back into that land before he can do it for them as a nation. He can only do it for individuals until then. And I go back to the New Covenant and I find in Jeremiah 31 the promise of the New Covenant is in the context which I read I will bring you back and I will make a New Covenant with you. And the promise of Joel 2 is I will bring you back and I will pour out my spirit on all kinds of flesh. And to the nation the promise of spiritual restoration is always in the context of physical restoration first. How can they believe God will restore them spiritually if he hasn't done the first step? Do you see what I'm saying? And therefore the messianic promises are related for them, unlike for us Gentiles, they are related for them to the Jews being back in that land and the Gentiles coming for the Feast of Tabernacles. That's part of God's plan. Now when I turn to the New Testament, do I find this confirmed? Well, I find that Jesus made it quite clear that the Jews were not finished as a nation. Let me just pick up two examples. Do you remember when, well, they, they welcomed him, but he saw through it and he wept. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks beneath her wings. Whenever I climbed the Mount of Olives, I found myself weeping with Jesus. And with King David, they wept on the same spot. King David wept over Jerusalem on the same spot. And he felt he wanted to just cuddle them and bring them close and hide them from the world inside himself. And they wouldn't. He said, you won't see me again. You won't see me again. Until. Until. And the word until is the key word in the New Testament. Until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And that's from Psalm 118, the Hallel Psalm that is sung at the Feast of Tabernacles. And psalm 113 to 118 is sung every day at the Feast of Tabernacles. You read them. They're all about the Gentiles and the nations coming to praise God for what he's done for the Jews. And they finish with that lovely welcome. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus said, you won't see me again until you say that and then he said Jerusalem will be trodden down by Gentiles until until there's the word again until the time of the Gentiles is over and I just want to say without this kind of panic guessing that is I'm afraid all the rage now and I'm having to exercise a cautionary ministry about this who think Jesus is coming back when the planets line up in 1982 and who think it's this decade. I do not believe that Jesus could come before the end of the decade at the very earliest. Scripture tells me not to expect him before the very end of the decade at the earliest. Too many things have to happen first. But they can happen quickly. Nevertheless, the time of the Gentiles is running out. It really is. And our going to the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem was just one tiny straw in the water. 
before I spoke to, at the Feast of Tabernacles, the Lord gave me a little prophetic word. Just as I stood praising the Lord with that great company and feeling the excitement of the occasion, I said, Lord, what do you think about this? How do you feel about this? You often hear the Lord if you ask him questions, you know. That's how Habakkuk became a prophet. He asked him questions. The Lord answered. When the Lord answers, you've got to pass it on. And into my mind just came a very simple message, and I just passed it on. I said, I believe the Lord is saying this. I have waited a long time for this. But this is only the mustard seed. And it will grow until all the nations of the world come and nest here. What exciting days these are. Jesus said, until, until. And the last question his disciples asked Jesus is the most significant. They said on the Mount of Olives, as he said goodbye to them, Lord, when are you going to restore national sovereignty to Israel? When? And Jesus did not say what many modern scholars would say. Jesus did not say, oh, how long shall I be with you? The wrong question, even the last one is the wrong one. Don't you realize my kingdom is not of this world? I'm never going to do that. You're still thinking in old Jewish terms. You're still thinking of a political messiah. Oh, my children, you're getting it all wrong. How long shall I be with you? And will the Son of Man find faith when he comes on, on earth? Now, you'd have thought that's how he would answer according to some understanding of Scripture. He didn't answer that way. He just said, I'm not going to tell you when. I'm not going to tell you when. And if that does not tell you that Jesus believed in the future of that nation, I don't know what will. There's a glorious opportunity to correct wrong thinking if they were wrong to ask. But he didn't correct it. Just said, it's not for you to know. That's, that's Dad's secret. And then comes Paul with that magnificent section. I say again, it is not a parenthesis. And if you cut out the chapter headings, you'll get the continuity of the gospel. And the gospel says there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. There is no separation either. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Then what about the Jews? Have they not been separated? Never. That's the argument, do you see? If the Jews had been forfeit, had lost their place and been, had forfeited it, then that promise is not true. You can be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But the Jews cannot be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Has God rejected them, says Paul? Never. Oh, a hardening in part has come upon them. Until, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Until. Always that little word, until. Do you keep hearing it? Underline it in your Bible, in red. Until, until. And so by the mercy of God, we wild olives have been grafted in. We don't fit. The natural branches have been taken out. But believe me, he can fit them back in much better than he fitted you in. Fitted you in. Their natural branches, they fit. I remember talking to a, a lovely looking Jewish girl in her 20s. And she said, are you trying to tell me that Jesus is alive today? And I said, yes. And she said, but that means he must be the Messiah, our Messiah. I said, yes. And she talked to him and she found out he was alive because he replied. And within five minutes she was teaching me theology. <laughs> she understood more than I'd seen in all the years of study, in all my Gentile theological degree. It's as if it was all there just waiting for the key. And the key is the resurrection of Jesus, of course. That unlocks all the background, all their history has prepared them for that day. And the natural branch was back in, much more deeply rooted back in than I had ever been. It was astonishing to listen to her talk. She said, then it means this, and it means this, and it means this. I thought, my, it does, yeah. That's given me another sermon. It really does. But she was a natural branch. 
and I'm a wild olive grafted in and you know I bring all my Gentile preconceptions all my Greek background which separates the flesh and the spirit and the supernatural and the natural and I was brought up in an England that is based on Greek thinking and I found when I go to Israel I get it together to the Hebrews there's no division between sacred and secular there's no division between flesh and spirit there's no division between supernatural and natural it's all of life and when I take a party out on an El Al Jumbo jet, when we get near Israel, I say to my party, we're going to get this whole plane singing psalms. You watch. And I just start singing some psalms in Hebrew. And the whole Jumbo jet is soon singing hallelujah to the Lord. I can't do that on British Airways. But we can do it on El Al. In fact, we've had a whole El Al Jumbo jet, all the passengers in the fourth section back, singing and dancing, praising the Lord, the entire plane load, and the plane was flying like this. And the pilot, after half an hour, said, would you please return to your seats? We're going through some turbulence. After we're through, you can go back to your concert. And the whole of the way home, we just sang and danced and praised the Lord in the back of a jumbo jet. Because it's all of life. When the Israeli soldiers went to Entebbe to rescue the hostages, they sang psalms on the way there. British Tommies don't do that. Somehow I'm a Gentile and I just have to keep going to Israel because there I see. There I expect miracles. I find it difficult to believe in miracles here in a Gentile world. I go there. I remember vividly the last time we had a little service at the garden tomb, communion service, six o'clock in the morning. And um, suddenly I said, you know, Jesus is not in that tomb, he's here. And he's alive and he's the same Jesus. Is anybody sick among us? And I didn't know. Normally I'm afraid I won't take anybody who's sick because it's a pretty hectic trip. And uh, there were two people there. One, a man had broken two ribs just before coming, was strapped up. I noticed he was looking pretty pale and he never told me. I think he thought I wouldn't take him if he told me. And he was drugging himself to get rid of the pain and he was in real agony moving. And a lady had developed angina three weeks before. And though she'd been told not to come, she'd never told me and she'd come. And I noticed she'd been looking a bit grey. This was the first morning and we'd walked through the streets and just a little walk had done it. And bless them, we just said, Jesus is here. And they were healed instantly. They took no more drugs. When she got home, she went back to the specialist and said, there's not a trace of it, not a trace. They both have been fit as fiddles ever since. But I, I find I have no problem expecting that out there because it's a Hebrew world. It's, it's a real world. They understand God is there. Now, that doesn't mean they're a sacred state, about the same number in synagogues on Sunday as in church here. And you can go from the Mia Shearim with all its notices about modesty and dress for women, and you can go down to the nudist beach at Ashkelon, and you've got the whole range. But life is a whole and their toast when they drink is l'chaim, l'chaim. I've done that at a communion service and lifted the wine cup and said l'chaim. We're not toasting a dead saviour to life. Well, this is where they are. I'm getting away from my subject, aren't I? Romans 9 to 11. God can graft them back in much more easily than he fits Gentiles into the Jewish salvation. And that Paul finishes, he will graft them back in. As he's had mercy on us, he's hardened them so that he have, may have mercy on the Gentiles, but he will have mercy on them. And when the Gentiles are in, he's going to bring them in. And so all Israel shall be saved. Oh, the depth of the mercy of God. Then straight on in the argument, I beseech you by the mercy of God, present your bodies. There is no break in the argument. There is no parenthesis. This is part of the gospel, which is a Jewish gospel. And alas and alack, so many preachers and commentators put the stress on Romans 1 to 8 and 12 onwards and kind of treat this as a kind of aside if you're interested and almost as if, if it wasn't there, they wouldn't miss it. What a tragic abuse of the Word of God. And of course in the book of Revelation, I recently read a letter in Buzz magazine criticizing some of the something I'd said about the second coming and this person said the church is not mentioned from Revelation 4 to Revelation 19 
I just want to know who the saints are, who the witnesses are, who the martyrs are, all the way through those chapters. I find Jew and Gentile together all the way through. In Revelation 7, I find 144,000 Jews and then a multitude that no man can number out of every kindred and tribe and tongue have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and come out of the great tribulation, which means that we're in it. And I see Jew and Gentile together. And I get to the end of the book and I see the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And I find that on the foundations are the names of the twelve apostles, all Jewish, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes, all Jewish. And there isn't a Gentile name on it. And so you get these people who say the Jews are stuck on earth and the Christians have been wafted out to heaven and there's God trying to put it together in the middle of all that misunderstanding. The new Jerusalem is for both. My destiny is bound up with the Jewish people. There will be one flock and one shepherd and I can't wait to get there. It's the king of Jews who's the king of kings. It is the knowledge of scripture which has led many of our statesmen to their attitude to Israel, from Winston Churchill to Harold Wilson. It is the loss of the biblical background that is throwing our politics into confusion now. I'll come back to that. Because now I move to what the Spirit is saying today, God's words today. They never contradict Scripture, and they are so in line. First, what is the Holy Spirit doing among Gentile Christians in relation to all this? I'm sorry, it's 11 o'clock. I need just about 20 minutes more. Could we continue? I'd much rather keep the flow than, than break it. Uh, but somebody can put the kettle on. <laughs> right. What is the Holy Spirit doing among Gentile Christians? For the first time in any revival that I know of, the Holy Spirit is turning the, the attention of Gentiles to Jerusalem and the Jews. Now whatever you think about the charismatic renewal, I happen to believe it's of God and that God for the last 15 years has been seeking to prepare a prophetic people and that with all the excess and imbalance that some have got into, God is in this and God's Holy Spirit is moving. And I find that even those that are anti it are still willing to receive the choruses that came out of it. And those choruses are a clue. How many of them are about Zion? Have you noticed this? At a meeting in Solihull a fortnight ago, three weeks ago, they were singing, Ways places of Jerusalem, da 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 dum our God reigns, you know it? And I stopped them and I said, how many of you actually thought of Jerusalem when you sang it? And only six hands went up out of 600 Christians. I said, why do you think the Holy Spirit gave that song? And why do you think the music is so often Yiddish or Israeli music? And you love it. This has never happened before in any movement of the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit is creating a love for the Jews and an interest in them and a love for Jerusalem. And that's led to Holy Spirit conferences in Jerusalem in the 70s. Now let me say something else which may be a little difficult for some of you, but let me mention it. Pope John the 23rd. To me, the two most significant things about his brief four year, years in office were these. Let me take the second first. He died after nine days of mortal agony during which he refused drugs. And during that last nine days, there was just one prayer on his lips. Lord, another Pentecost. Lord, another Pentecost. And he died on Whit Monday with those words on his lips. Do you think God heard that prayer? I do. I got into trouble some years ago for saying in Scotland, in fact many years ago, that revival could come through the Roman Catholic Church. I'm afraid people couldn't receive it at that time and still many can't. But I believe God heard that prayer and the breath of God's Spirit has been blowing the cobwebs away from the Vatican corridors. 
I hope you're aware of this and have a heart like Barnabas that can see the grace of God and be glad. There is no need to compromise on Catholic dogma at all. I have given a lecture on the Virgin Mary to 40 Catholic theologians and priests with a cardinal sitting three feet in front of me and have not compromised the scripture one bit and found that our fellowship and relationship in the Lord was strong enough to cope with that. So I don't compromise on a single thing. I don't believe in the immaculate conception, the bodily assumption, the perpetual virginity or the heavenly mediation of the Virgin Mary. But we Protestants have downplayed the Virgin Mary. And we hold up every other saint in the scripture but her. When she was the one who allowed the Holy Spirit to come upon her at great social cost. And she was the one who spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost. And these are things we never dare mention by reaction from the false teaching. But let's get back to scripture. And let's teach the truth. I would to God that every woman in the Christian church would follow the Virgin Mary in submitting to the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to reproduce Christ within her and be willing to meet with 120 others and pray that the Lord would pour out the Spirit. Well, the other thing for which Pope John, I believe, will be remembered in heaven is that he told the entire Catholic Church that Jews are not to be held responsible for killing Jesus. He didn't, as the papers said, absolve them or forgive them for it. That was not what he said. That's a, a, a terribly twisted version. He was saying they are not even to be held responsible so they don't need forgiveness for that. And I believe those are two very significant things. Well, that doesn't mean I go along with all the present Pope is doing. He seems to be switching to a reactionary mood, which is not of the Spirit. Nevertheless, we've got to watch what the Spirit is doing and saying. Even in those areas where we tended to say, can any good thing come out of Rome? The Spirit is blowing where he lists today, and you can't control the speed or direction. Now, what is the Spirit doing among Jews? I wonder if you've been hearing do you know that the so-called Jews for Jesus movement is estimated now at between 25 and 30,000 young Jews, mostly in New York, but scattered around the world, who found Jesus as their Messiah. They've not become Christians. Hallelujah for that. I never tell a Jew you must become a Christian because Christian is both a dirty word and a Gentile word. And where does the scripture say they've got to become Christians? My burden is to say, please be better Jews. Please be more Jewish. Find your Jewish Messiah, but be more Jewish, not less. Don't become Gentiles. Be full Jews, completed Jews, whole Jews. And you've got something for the world. I was talking to a, a very prominent Jew in Israel, and I said to him, and I found myself, it's extraordinary, putting my hand on his trousers, on his knee, and getting hold of his trousers while I said it. Only later did I read in the scriptures that Gentiles will seize the skirt of a Jew and say, tell us of your God. And I had hold of his trousers and I said, you know, you Jews have given the world so much science, music, art. When are you going to give us the one thing the world needs that only you can give us? The full knowledge of God. And you know, at the Feast of Tabernacles, I said that again, and that touched the Jews more than anything else. Because they are suffering a crisis of identity. Who is a Jew? They don't really know. What is a Jew? They don't really know. They're always discussing it. And I said, a true Jew is someone who shares the faith of Abraham with others. That's what a true Jew is. Oh, but you say there's nothing about Jesus in there. Oh, yes, there is. Abraham saw my day and was glad, said Jesus. And a true Jew is someone who shares the faith of Abraham with others. They're not becoming Christians, but oh, they're becoming Jewish. And even among the unbelieving Jews, the Holy Spirit is preparing the unbelieving Jews for fellowship with us. I wonder if you're aware. How many of you watched the Eurovision Song Contest? Anybody? 
a few. Did your heart not leap? Did you not see what the Holy Spirit was doing? Here, millions around Europe were watching. And here was a song. Hallelujah with a song. Ta da 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 bum. Lovely song. And uh, here was Israel teaching Europe to say, Praise the Lord. It's only one straw, but did you see what God was doing in that? How very nearly they didn't pull it off, and then at the very last moment, this was the winner. Alas, they couldn't afford to put it on the next year. They haven't the money. They're in terrible straits, economically. Do you know that ever since 1967, not 48, since 1967, when old Jerusalem came back under Jewish sovereignty, their attitude to Jesus has changed. Did you know that? It has changed. In 1923, a rabbi wise preached a sermon on Jesus and it caused a riot among the Jews. But since 1967, not only is the Hebrew New Testament taught in Israeli schools, but 29 books or pamphlets or major articles have been written about Jesus of Nazareth by Jews. From Sholem Asher's book, Jesus of Nazareth, onwards. And do you know that there is a Jewish rabbi called Dr. Rapid who is giving lectures around the world in synagogues on the resurrection of Jesus? And he believes in it. And a rabbi in Jerusalem recently gave a lecture on Jesus of Nazareth and when he invited questions, a student said, you have talked as if Jesus is the Messiah. And he said, no, I don't believe that. I'm a Jew. I don't believe that. But if when he comes, the Messiah turns out to be Jesus, I will not be surprised. <laughs> now, that strikes our sense of humor, but I tell you, that is incredible in the light of the history I shared with you earlier. It is incredible. Now, that doesn't mean they're any more amenable to missionaries. Far from it. If anything, they're harder. But they are amenable to one thing. Love. Love. There are lonely people when they know that somebody else loves them, they sense God. I had to fly back from the Feast of Tabernacles three o'clock in the morning on the student flight. And I arrived at Tel Aviv airport and the girl handling security was obviously in a bad mood, but three o'clock in the morning, I'm not a very good Christian anyway, and I understood. And, and there she was, and she really put us through the mill. And uh, it was partly because it's the student flight and all kinds of people get onto it. And she said, where have you been? I said, well, I've, uh, I brought a group out to Israel and they went home yesterday and now I'm traveling home. Why did you stay? Well, I've been up to Jerusalem. Who did you see? Well, friends. What sort of friends? Some Jewish, some Christian. And she said, what have you been doing? And I said, I've been to Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. You Christian? Yes. Christians don't come to Sukkot. Well, I said, we haven't been, but we came this year. A thousand of us came from 24 countries. No, she said, Christians don't come to the Feast of Tabernacles. I said, we did. She wouldn't believe me. So I said, look, there's a man who's just driven me to the airport. He will tell you in Hebrew, if you like, what I've been doing. And he came over and told her. And her eyes went like saucers. And, and she said, you mean that you Christians have come to share the Feast of Tabernacles with us? I said, yes. And her face wreathed in smiles, and she did a little dance. And she said, oh, you've made me so happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. And I left her saying this over and over again. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. And I realized how lonely she felt. And how love began to touch her. Well, a rabbi recently said in Jerusalem, we Jews are very proud of our Einsteins, our Heinrich Heiners, and our Sigmund Freuds we ought to be much prouder of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? So in the last few minutes, let me tell you, what can we do practically about this? What kind of response does God want from you? What is to be our attitude to the state of Israel and individual Jews and the two are closely bound together? 
Well, we can wash our hands of the whole thing. Say, no, I'm called to Pakistan, I'm called to Latin America, and if somebody feels a particular call, that's their missionary call. I don't think you can do that. Not after this morning. Do you know that six British prime ministers since 1939 have washed their hands of Israel and disappeared from office within weeks, even days, even hours? This is a side of our history that's not known. In July of 1945, Churchill wrote to Dr. Weissman and he had always supported Israel and kept all his promises to Zion and he wrote a crushing letter to Dr. Weissman in July 1945 and said I want nothing more to do with Israel I'm going to be too busy looking after the peace as Prime Minister in England and I, I, I'm just not going to help you anymore Dr. Weissman was crushed by that because Churchill had been one of the main supporters of Israel in fact Churchill had sent Lawrence's of Arabia's brother to be Lawrence of Israel and nobody's ever heard of Lawrence of Israel they've only heard of Lawrence of Arabia but uh, Churchill had, did a lot for Israel and then he went back on it and two weeks later Churchill was finished and the whole country was surprised not least Churchill himself Neville Chamberlain's white paper of 1939 and within weeks he was mortally sick I could go through Sir Anthony Eden within days of letting Israel down. He was finished. Alec Douglas Hume, Edward Heath, his part in the 1973 war is shameful. There were two shiploads of spares for centurion tanks that were already sailing for Israel with spares which Israel had paid for, for the tanks which we had sold to Israel and Mr. Heath ordered those ships to turn around and come back home on the first day of that war because of Arab pressure and he stole vital spares and British tanks in the Sinai desert were lying helpless because we had stolen the parts from them where is Mr. Heath now? he's a non-entity the final one was Mr. Callaghan that, was, that took three days President Carter said, if I can pull off this peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, they're going to get no oil from Arab countries. Would you give some North Sea oil to Israel if they need it? And Callahan had let it be known that when we got into surplus production in the North Sea, Israel would be considered for surplus. The following day, Wedgwood Ben persuaded Callahan to go back on that promise. One day later, Callahan was voted out on one vote because an MP in Leeds was ill I could tell you about Canada where Pierre Trudeau was Prime Minister and suddenly to everyone's surprise a man called Joe Clark had replaced him and one of the promises Joe Clark made on the platform of his election was we will move the Canadian Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and he bought the Jewish vote with that promise eight months later he broke the promise and said I'm not going to do it a week later he was out and Pierre Trudeau was back in and people said how come the man only lasted eight months I tell you we're dealing with very serious things you cannot wash your hands of the Jews God hasn't Pilate has of Jesus but you can't do the same thing so what can we do for Jesus brothers that's what they are for his brethren after the flesh well first I believe our attitude is the important thing before we consider any action whatever and that must be corrected in prayer before you pray for a Jew before you pray for Israel today get God to correct your attitude if it's been wrong and the right attitude we can't expect the Jewish attitude to Christians to change not in the light of all I've told you but we can expect the Christian attitude to Jews to change and ours and must be in the spirit an attitude of three things humility humility instead of going to say oh we've got a messiah we've got a savior and we've come to tell you about our savior it's a totally different attitude to go and say do you know by the mercy of God I discovered your messiah and your scriptures 
yours. Paul says we're to make them jealous, not envious, but jealous. Now, you make a person envious if you've got, got something that belongs to you and says, I've got it, and you would like it. That's envy. Jealousy is something different. I may envy another man his wife. I don't actually, but I could envy another man his wife. But if somebody runs off with my wife, that's jealousy. Do you see the difference? Envy is about somebody else's property. Jealousy is about my own. And some of us are seeking to make Israel jealous by producing better Israeli music than they can produce themselves. By saying, this isn't our Messiah, it's yours. This isn't our music, it's yours. This isn't our Bible, it's yours. You go in humility and say, it's only by the mercy of God that I have been grafted in to the Jewish salvation. Not, we Gentiles and the new Israel, and we've come to give you our Savior. But we've come to tell you that by the mercy of God, we discovered your Savior. And the second thing is penitence. And to begin with an apology and to ask for forgiveness. That is not the superiority complex with which most of us go. I heard of an Israeli guide who's been baptized 16 times by the tourist parties he's taken round. They all come home thrilled to bits to tell their church at home. They got the guide converted and in the water. When will they learn? He found it was the biggest thrill for them that he could give them. And it's his job to thrill his tourist guides. And it helped the tips too. When will they learn? We go in penitence. Not to come back with a, a Jewish scalp on our belt. And the third thing, we go in love. Love. If the love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts, that will show and be felt. The attitude is all important before any action can take place. I wonder if I could just... Well, Corrie ten Boom, they knew that she loved them enough to go to Ravensbrück concentration camp for them. That's what they're looking for in Christians. And Corrie ten Boom's nephew, Peter van Verden, is now a real blessing to Israel. Through music because he too has the love of God shed abroad in his heart. I share with you just one or two experiences. The people that I find most open out in Israel are the very people that most Christians never go near because we don't know how to handle the situation. The one group in Israel that I find is more open to God than any other. I wonder which you would think it was. It's certainly not the Mia Shearim and the Orthodox. It's the artists, the artists. And I always make for the artist colonies in Safed and Ein Had and outside Jerusalem. And I remember going into a studio of a, a, an Israeli artist, his name is Motka Bloom. He's one of the top artists. And I went in and there hanging before me was a canvas about two feet square of Jerusalem, an impressionist painting of Jerusalem. At first, if you're close to it, you can see nothing. It's just a mass of tiny little bits of color. And you have to stand about 10 feet back and you have to wait 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, Jerusalem floats out in three dimensions towards you. It is the most incredible painting. And you begin to see little alleyways and domes and staircases. Oh, it's beautiful. I fell in love with it. And every time I go, I try to bring back just one thing that will give me a deeper link and, and be very precious and will be a conversation starter as well. And I said to him, oh, how much is that picture? And he looked me up and down and he said, well, you couldn't afford it. And I said, okay, you, you got me summed up. I said, but how much is it? Well, he said, it is my best and I keep it for exhibitions. But he said, uh, I don't think I could put a price on it. But he said, I have been offered 120,000 for it. I said, you mean Israeli lira? He said, no, sterling. I said, oh, well, you're right, I can't afford it. <laughs> there happened to be a man with me who could, actually, but I didn't say so. And I said, you know, I feel like the man in the Bible who said uh, he would sell everything he'd got to get the one thing that he loved. 
But I said, if you, even if I sold everything I had, I still couldn't buy it. But I said, that is the most beautiful picture. And then as a kind of jocular aside, which Jews often make, the kind of religious joke that comes in, he said, of course, if the Messiah came, I'd give it to him. I said, what did you say? He said, I don't know, what did I say? I said, you said if the Messiah came, you'd give it to him? Do you mean that? And he said, well, who knows if he's coming? I said, I do. He said, how do you know? I said, God has promised it, and I don't believe in a God who breaks his word. And we had a lovely chat. And then I said, you know, when the Messiah comes, he will love that picture. It's of the city he wept over. He, he will love it. He said, you think so? I said, I'm sure he will. He'll love it. And then we parted. The next day, two friends of mine went into the same studio. They didn't know I'd been in. They knew nothing of this. And they saw the picture and fell in love with it and said, how much is that picture? And he said, it's not for sale. They said, why not? He said, I'm keeping it for the Messiah. And if I'm not here, my children will give it to him. Eighteen months later, I went back. And the picture had gone. And I thought, oh dear, he sold it. And I turned to come out before he saw me. And then he saw me and he said, I know you. So I said, yes, I was here 18 months ago. I said, dare I ask what has happened to the picture? And he looked a little, not embarrassed, but a little uncertain. And he said, uh, oh, it, I put it up in the, in the roof. So that's a strange thing to say. I thought, dear me, I've embarrassed him. He's finally yielded to temptation and needed the money, and he obviously did. But I said, could I see the picture again, please? I'd love to see it again. Oh, no, he said, it's, it's right up in the roof. I said, please, I'd love to see it. And he climbed up and brought it down. I said, what's it doing up in the roof? He said, so many people are trying to buy it, and I need the money. I've had to put it out of temptation's way. Four weeks ago, I took a few friends into the same studio and I said, I'd love you to see this picture. And there he was, and I said, could we see it? He climbed up and brought it down. And then he whispered behind their backs to me, he said, I haven't seen it since you were last here. His best picture. Nobody sees it. And then he just said, we're waiting for someone, aren't we? I can't crash into that man's heart with a tract. I can't do it. And if you ask me, have you got him converted yet? I have to say, I don't know. I just know the Spirit's working in both our hearts. And I feel the love of Jesus for the man. And if that's the love of Jesus, Jesus isn't going to let him go. The attitude is all important. And if, if it's your ambition to get out to Israel and come back with a Jewish scalp or two, I beg you, get to prayer today. And very finally, what can you do practically? Well, I'll give you just four S's. Supplication, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You don't know what you're doing for yourself if you do. They shall prosper who love it. Secondly, support Israel when the world is against her. It will cost you something. The Arabs don't like it. And I know that those who support Israel will soon be regarded as economic traitors to Britain because 21% of our bank reserves are Arab investments which could be withdrawn tomorrow. And our major export market is Saudi Arabia. And firms in this country are signing contracts to get export orders with the Arabs. And into that contract is written a promise never to have any business dealings with Jews. And that includes Lanes, the Christian firm is rebuilding that house right opposite this church. And we are being blackmailed to boycott Israel. And I say when you go out and buy some groceries, buy some fruit juice from Israel. You say, but that's only a tiny thing. Every little helps. And a friend of mine who's a Dutch businessman believed that the best thing he could do for Israel in the light of this Arab boycott and blackmail, and it's already trapped a thousand major British firms and all our banks except Barclays, we are sold out to Islam. And the false prophet Muhammad is gripping this land. 
And I want you to realize that. And realize that you could indeed, in acting on what I've said this morning, risk your life. The one prime minister in our land who kept every promise to Israel, and though I couldn't list a single principle he stood for apart from this, he stood by Israel the whole time and risked his life again and again, was told not to, but he did, was Harold Wilson. And he was longer in office than any other prime minister, and he decided to go. He wasn't thrown out. Is that a coincidence, or is God the God of Israel? Well, my Dutch friend decided to get together a few businessmen and to open up export markets for Israel. And in the month of July this year, they got $35 million worth of exports for Israel around the world. Just a handful of Christian businessmen. And that man left a tiny little business behind in Holland. And within one year, he was a millionaire through working for Israel because he had to do it on a commission basis. And within 12 months, he was a millionaire. Oh, Abraham, those who bless you will be blessed. And those who curse you will be cursed. And he didn't want to be a millionaire. He just found himself that way. And they are opening up the exports. Well, you can do that in a very small way. You can serve them in some way. You can see that they do get support in this terrible economic crisis. And they could be defeated economically where they've not been defeated militarily. And finally, yes, pray for their salvation. We mustn't miss that out. That's the biggest thing of all. That they may be saved but that we may approach them in the way in which the love of God will get through, that they will regard us as friends first and open their hearts and forget the dreadful things that have been done in the name of Jesus and realize that Christians love them. That's what that procession at the Feast of Tabernacles did a month ago. And they saw a different sort of Christian. They didn't see Christians coming to build shrines and cathedrals. They didn't see Christians coming with so many images that the Jewish soul was revolted by it all, by the sheer tawdriness of it. I cannot go in to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the Church of the Nativity. I, it revolts me. And I feel if this is Christianity and what they see, I don't blame them for thinking the way they do. But young people are now going out in little groups to live on a kibbutz. Project kibbutz is one of the most exciting things that's happening and young people are going out for a year as a little Christian fellowship, four or five to one kibbutz instead of one Christian going by himself, four or five, and they're going there to live and to love and to let them see Christians together. And that's doing wonders. You can go and serve them, but all the time you are seeking their salvation and you are saying to yourself, they do not worship a false god. They worship the true God. They are on the right lines. If only they would go further along the same lines. If only they'd come to their Messiah. That's the attitude. You will never witness to a Jew unless you earn the right to speak. And you earn it by love. Emperor Frederick V of Prussia said to Heidegger the philosopher, give me one proof of the existence of God. And Heidegger replied, your majesty, the Jews. The Jews. And I finish with a silly little poem, but it has truth in it. How odd of God to choose the Jews, but odder still, for those who choose the Jewish God and shun the Jews. <laughs>